We have a whole day of presentations, uh, but I want all of you to be um, vocal. Please stop at any point if there are anything in the presentation that's unclear. We want your voice to be heard, and we want uh, this to be a useful day for you to um, take information with you. So I'm going to start uh, just doing a brief uh, overview of kidney cancer just to set the stage for the other presenters for this morning. So I'll start off by just saying here is a picture of the kidney and uh, not all tumors that are in the kidney are really kidney cancer. The ones that we are going to be talking today is those that arise in the cortex. So this is the cortex and these are the ones that are the real kidney cancer that we are going to be talking about today. What are the other tumors that can happen in the kidney? You can see that this is the part where urine is made and it comes through the urinary tube called the ureters. And it's a common cancer that usually happens in the bladder, but you can have this type of tumors happening in the kidney as well. And those are called transitional cell carcinomas. They're more like bladder cancers. Then you can have Stanford is an um, institution with expertise that's world renowned in a disease called lymphomas. They usually happen in lymph nodes all over the body, but because we are an uh, institution of referral, inevitably when we see sometimes tumors in the kidney, they end up being a lymphoma. There are other cancers that can happen in the kidney, but our day today is going to be focused on the kidney cancer that arises in the cortex. So what is the incidence of this disease? This is a slide taken off from the American Cancer Society. They put up these every year with sort of estimates what's the, what is the burden of disease that we are talking about. And this is a new cancers that happen in men and women. And sadly, kidney cancer features as the top 10 diagnosis both in men and in women. So about 40,000 cancers each diagnosed each year in men and in women about 25,000. So it's certainly not as big as diseases like prostate cancer and breast cancer, but certainly it's enough for us to have our voices heard and for us to continue working on this disease to get the best that we can in terms of um, outcomes. So what about uh, uh, di kidney cancer at diagnosis? You know, most patients present with, uh, fortunately today, we see a lot of patients coming into the emergency room for another reason. Maybe ha they have a gallstone or they have abdominal pain and incidentally kidney cancer is discovered. Those are good and they represent about less than 50% of the time where it's confined to the kidney. Unfortunately, half a quarter and even a third spread by the time the diagnosis is made because kidney is in an anatomic location where if you don't have a symptom, the tumor can continue to grow. And unfortunately for a third of patients, by the time the diagnosis is made, it may have spread uh, elsewhere. Here is a brief staging as you hear multiple talks today. I just want to set the stage for what the different stages are. So stage one are small tumors, less than seven centimeters confined to the kidney. Stage two tumors are uh, greater than seven centimeters, but they are still in the kidney. And you're going to hear about the surgical management for those group of patients. Stage three, we call it locally advanced disease, where there is tumor that's left the kidney to either the blood vessels, either the renal vein or the inferior vena cava, or the fat involves the perinephric tissue. And finally, stage four disease is if we have distant disease, so whether there's lymph nodes up in the neck or disease in the lung, liver, bone, or brain would be considered stage four. So we now know that kidney cancer is not one disease. It used to be uh, even five years ago, we would classify all of kidney cancer as one. We know that this list is growing and it's just, I have another slide where this list now includes 20 different types. And I think that speaks to good things where we are learning more about this disease. We are learning more about the biology. We don't want to lump all kidney cancers as one, but we want to get 
to subgroups where we are able to have different treatments that are directed to different subtypes. But the most common kidney cancer is called clear cell, and all of our drugs that we have today are really focused on this histologic subtype, and that's where the drug development has been focused the most. That represents 75%. There's a less common one, and all of the rest are lumped as non-clear cells. So there's clear cell, and the rest are considered non-clear cell. What does non-clear cell mean? It includes those with a papillary type, and we now know again that there is type 1 papillary and there is type 2 papillary. And each of these are specific mutations that drive these different tumors. And I think as the, uh, what we look forward in the future are specific drugs that target each of this, that we will have different drugs for each of this. And then there's a less common one called chromophobe and oncocytoma. We have other subtypes, which I haven't actually put in, but there are many more that are coming. So overall, just a brief slide on the background. So again, you know, we said this is in 2012, but I already showed you it's around 40,000 patients, put new diagnosis per year. Majority are clear cell. About a third of patients, unfortunately, have stage four at diagnosis. Prior to 2005, we had very little in terms of medical treatments for kidney cancer, and it was all uh, with the immunotherapy or cytokine with a drug called interferon. But today, things have changed remarkably, and we are going to be spending the latter part talking about it. So here's a slide which I'm really proud of to talk about where we headed and where we are today. So these are the drugs that we have had. Just in the last decade, you can see we have made so much progress. Had I done this talk in 1993, I would have stopped short with one drug, which was high-dose interleukin-2. Starting in 2005, we have had remarkable success in approval of various drugs for kidney cancer, and we are going to be talking about serafinib, sunitinib, another class of drugs called mTOR inhibitors with temsirolimus and everolimus, there's avastin or bevacizumab, pazopinib, and axitinib. I know it's 2012, and it seems like what's happened since 2012. By the end of the day, I'm going to share some new drugs that we may be having even by the end of this year. So what do we know? A little bit just about uh, uh, one slide on the biology, just so that we understand wh wh where things started and how drug development went on for kidney cancer. To the left is a normal. This is what happens in normal situations. We have a protein called VHL. It binds to this hydroxyproline and combines with this element called HIF1-alpha. And once this complex is bound, it gets broken down by ubiquitin and proteasome, and then the HIF gets degraded in our body. That's the normal process that needs to happen. In kidney cancer, and when this VHL protein is mutated or is abnormal, this is what happens. Here, VHL is unable to bind via a hydroxyproline with HIF. So HIF just accumulates in your body without getting degraded. And what are the consequences when we have too much HIF in our body? You get all of these proteins called VEGF and PDGF, and this is what drives these tumor cells to proliferate and spread. So knowing this was really important, that now that we know this is what happens in kidney cancer, people then started thinking about how about if we find ways to block VEGF. If VEGF is what is increased, let's find drugs that target VEGF, and that's what this slide is. And it just shows you that there are many different ways by which we can block VEGF. You can block the ligand with a drug called bevacizumab, or you can block the receptor with a variety of drugs that we are going to be talking about today. So these are the main two, um, two classes of drugs that we have in kidney cancer. One are called VEGF inhibitors, and the second class are called mTOR inhibitors. And these are names that you're going to be hearing a lot by the uh, end of the day. And so I'm just going to wrap up this by just saying this is what kidney cancer medical therapy looks like in 2015. We actually have three classes of drugs. There's immunotherapy, and now it includes interferon and interleukin-2. 
And I think by the end of this year, there will be a new class of drugs called PD-1 inhibitors or a drug called nivolumab we are hoping will get approval by the end of this year. And there's also going to be a new drug called cabozantinib. Then there are VEGF inhibitors with sunitinib, sorafenib, pizopinib, axitinib, and bevacizumab, and mTOR inhibitors. So that's just a brief overview so that it puts in perspective and context some of the talks for today. Yes? I was, I'm a little confused because I see you giving references to So immunotherapy is definitely a separate class of drugs. They are not targeted drugs. They sort of, it's like if you get the flu, you know, how your whole uh, immune system is all revved up with a variety of chemicals that the body uh, secretes to help fight your flu. It's identical to that. That's what immunotherapy is when we mean for cancer therapy, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The targeted drugs, the VEGF inhibitors are all, the idea here was it was aimed at blocking the VEGF, so it's completely different from um, immunotherapy. So here is our agenda for today. Um, I gave a, I went a little bit over on my welcome. We are going to have Carrie Konoski from the uh, Kidney Cancer Association, who's sponsoring this uh, meeting today, talk a little bit about their association and what they can do for um, our patients. I'm then going to make a slight switch on the agenda because it makes sense to talk about local therapy first. What do you do when you have tumor confined to the kidney? And we are really uh, happy to have our um, surgeon here today, Dr. Jeff Son, who's an uh, assistant professor in urology. He's going to give us an update on what can be done for local therapy. So we're going to make a little bit of a switch, and then it makes sense for me to talk about medical therapy, and we are going to go over some of the drugs that I just spoke. And then we'll take a very small break, and then I would like for Sujata Narayan, who's one of our uh, medical oncologists here at Stanford, she's going to give us a little overview on clinical trials. I think that's a big part of all of the progress that's happened in kidney cancer, and I think as patients, it's nice to understand how this process works. Where do you start with clinical trials? What are your risks? What are the benefits? So Sujata is going to give us an overview about how clinical trials work. Then I think one of the um, uh, things that are really new is genomic testing. Who should we be doing it on? We think a lot of this is how we are going to be headed in the years to come. People are going to have their individual tumors tested, and maybe that will help us drive specific therapy. That's what personalized medicine is. It's so confusing today as to who should get it done, what do we do with the results. So we have one of our um, uh, fellows who's doing molecular testing, Joshua Gruber, He's going to come and talk to us a little bit about genomic testing, and I think that would be, he's going to give us some examples about some of the tests and see how we can learn from those. We'll take a break for lunch, and I think this latter part of the afternoon, we are going to talk a little bit about the imaging and how we can improve with some of the ways we can diagnose this early. Are there different modalities by which testing can be done? And then I'm going to have Tommy Messner, who uh, works with us in our research um, enterprise, talk a little bit about what Stanford has done in terms of how we collect blood tissue and what we hope to learn from that in the future. And then I uh, want the best part of the afternoon, which is really about a patient forum where uh, Jordan Chavez, who's a social worker, come and engage all of us in sharing our stories and how we can uh, help each other in this uh, journey for this disease. And then we'll wrap up. So with that, I'm uh, really hoping it'll be a good day for all of us to take some information.